from it some more. Uh, I said I was going to talk about first meeting, but the truth is, my first meeting, which I always thought was a meeting, really was what I would now call a sighting. <laughs> and I will explain that in the midst of this. My first sighting of Milton Acorn, November 1966, at the beginning of his glorious career. Location, the advanced mattress in Vancouver. If you don't know what the advanced mattress is, you'll find out. After experiencing the elation of seeing my first two poems published in Canada in Vancouver's Talon magazine, 1966, September, the editor of Talon, Jim Brown, invited me to meet him. We became friends. Two months later, in November, during Grey Cup Week in Vancouver, Jim invited me to attend a group poetry reading at a coffee house on 4th Avenue in Vancouver. I'd only seen and heard and been inspired by poetry readings up to this point atop Burnaby Mountain, mainly at Simon Fraser University's theater. <clears throat> Early that chilly evening, I hopped into Jim Brown's car that included two other passengers who I had not met before, who were also poets, Chuck Carlson and Bill Bissett. I was still in the infant stage of my career. If I had been asked to join in and read, I would have declined, out of extreme shyness at the time. Every poet I came in contact with nearly always added to my sense of awe. I could not believe I was really becoming a poet. And this is when I moved to Canada because I had no life goal living in the United States to be a poet. So Canada did inspire me. I did not realize even then that I was going to become my abiding obsession to write poetry. Now I can't be stopped. That evening's half a dozen readers included Jim Brown, Patrick Lane, Seymour Main, Judith Coppathorn, Chuck Carlson and Bill Bissett. Having read Al Purdy's inspiring breakthrough collection, Parable Horses, and seen the poet read from it at Simon Fraser, I had learned that the advanced mattress used to be a factory where Al Purdy once worked. From other poems in his book, I also discovered that he and Milton Acorn were pals and that Acorn was a carpenter. I met Patrick Lane right after Talon came out. His poems opened that issue of Talon, and mine closed them. He insisted when I met him that I get hold of a copy of Milton Acorn's Jawbreakers, which has already been mentioned tonight. I found that every copy was sold out in the bookstores around Vancouver, and that none were in the used bookstores. So, in desperation, I finally borrowed a copy of Jawbreakers from a local branch library, and I did not steal it. I was determined to make my own version of it by typing, do you remember, yellow second sheets? <laughs> Every poem that I really liked and bound them into it, my own eight and a half by 11 notebook copy. I've never been asked to pay the copyright for that. I still have this precious copy somewhere amongst all my papers. Acorn style was an influence on Al Purdy's style, and together, unbeknownst to them, their work somehow combined to influence me to write one of my earliest poems, Hitler's Favorite Movie, which was first published by Milton Wilson in the Canadian Forum. Since I had never met Milton Acorn and had never seen a photo of him, I had no idea what he even looked like. I only knew him through his poems and his underground reputation among poets who were becoming my friends. What a surprise it was then that at the end of the evening's advanced mattress reading, when we were all gathering to leave, that I turned and saw in one corner of the coffee house a hefty, formidable-looking man in long, rolled-up lumberjack sleeves, seated alone at a table with some empty beer bottles arrayed in front of him. <laughs> he was gruff-looking, but he also had a broad, toothsome, relaxed smile. He looked very pleased. I forget which poet I asked to answer my question. Who is that man sitting over there? Say, don't you know, X said, that's Milton Acorn. He runs this place. <laughs> no one had mentioned this to me beforehand. Or maybe I was just too excited, hobnobbing amongst my fellow poets, to hear everything spoken 
inside the car that took me to this reading, which was the first group reading I ever saw. I did not realize that Milton Acorn lived and worked in the city where I lived and worked. I could not believe I had been seated just a few tables away from him, completely out of my line of sight. But it would only have taken me half a minute to go over and meet him and shake his hand for the first time. But my shyness prevented me. While Milton now seemed an inescapable presence, simply seated and silent, a force of lyrical nature, I could sense that much once I experienced him reading his work later. There was now this invisible brick wall I must have been hiding behind. I was on the low end of the learning curve, how to talk to poets who I greatly admired. When the first poet who I ever heard read poetry aloud turned out to be Dorothy Livesey, she was in a classroom and I was standing outside and then sat down because I heard this amazing voice sharing what I knew was poetry. She wasn't talking to a class at Simon Fraser. I was too shy to approach her afterwards, but then I had not yet written my first poems in Canada. So this was my excuse earlier in that very same year, 1966. But now, what I call this chance sighting of Milton Acorn, like a flying saucer from another universe, was decidedly one-sided. I started off as a poet, mainly silent, awestruck, and timid. It was only meeting enough great poets reading at Simon Fraser, such as Al Purdy, Lionel Kearns, and William Stafford, each being friendly and outgoing, who gradually helped break the ice for me. It took more than a year to do that. They did such a good job of it, in fact, I found the hot spot to give my first solo reading right there at the SFU Theater in October 1968, the year of Expo, only two years after I was first published in Talent. I was 28 at the time, and this was two years after sighting Milton Acorn. Still too insecure then to meet him. When I did see him read, and I'm just adding this as a postscript, it was more than a decade later, and it was at Regina's Public Library, and was in a room upstairs on the second floor, and his reading was so much loved and beloved by everybody that was there that they kept asking for more and more and more. And I think he read even beyond the time the library closed because we wouldn't let him go. And then finally, when the whole thing was over with, I can say to you and each that this was one of the greatest readings I ever experienced because as he stood there reading, he was moved around the floor a lot, he put his feet down really securely, and he would approach people and he would just do, you were kind of sort of imitating him in a way there too. So uh, Milton Acorn was one of my influences. Patrick Lane did introduce me to his work. He said, you gotta get jawbreakers. So I did and I typed it. And that was before uh, we have everybody else here, I hope, and I'm gonna shut up now, uh, before everybody else realized that you can make your own books anyway, your own chapbooks. And you can have Luciano to also do books for you. And I'm gonna shut up now, thanks a lot.